We want to thank you for tuning in today to our newest program, Talking It Out. In this newest segment, Pastor David and Lorray will be discussing such topics as Bible prophecy, current events, and the Word of God. We trust each of you will enjoy today's edition of Talking It Out. Hello, friends. Pastor David Langford here again today with my daughter, Lorray. And we'd like to welcome you to this edition of Talking It Out. And we certainly hope and we pray that these programs are truly uplifting, inspiring, and encouraging you in this hour in which we're living in. There's a lot of uncertainty in the earth, but aren't you glad God is the greatest certainty of all? Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away in Matthew 24, 35. So the great comfort, the great solace that we have as Christians is knowing the certainty of Christ and of God. We've had the Bible given to us, written over a span of about 1,500 years. Long time. 40 40 writers, one author. What makes that so divine and so unique Muhammad was just one writer. Buddha was just one writer. God had 40 writers and one author. And we see the contiguous through all of the scriptures, how it had to be inspired by God. Because if you had 40 authors, you would have 40 different interpretations and views and perspectives. Mm -hmm. And what they all did was confirmed, collaborated, the authenticity of God's word. Nobody can confirm Muhammad's writings. Nobody can confirm Buddha's writings because that's all they have. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But the word of God gives us multiple writings. David prophesied. I believe it's nearly a thousand years before Messiah would come, how he would die. Uh, in Psalms 41, 9, he said, Mine own familiar friend whom I did eat with hath lifted up his hill against me. Who was David talking about? Judas Iscariot, whom he sat there at the Last Supper and had dinner with, yet he went and lifted up his hill against Christ and betrayed him. And how Isaiah Hundreds of years before the Messiah is born, he says, a virgin is going to conceive, and she's going to bear a son. Thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. And hundreds of years later, guess what? It It happened just like that. Micah says Christ would be born in Bethlehem. They had to leave and travel to Bethlehem to bring that prophecy to fruition. I mean, you could just sit here for weeks and weeks and weeks and talk about how significant and how accurate the Word of God is. When we look at all of the possibilities, there could be error here, there could be error there, because uh, they they were they were they were they were transcri- I should say tra- they were just scribes, and that they copied copied made them copies of the scripture. There was no printing press, so they hand wrote all of this out right. and would keep writing it, and it would get passed down. There was no such thing as a printing press. But yet the accuracy, yeah. God oversaw his word to make sure it was performed. And whatever God gave Micah or David or Isaiah or Daniel or Ezekiel, when it came to the New Testament, it all stayed in harmony. Yeah. It's amazing. And that's what gives us certitude about knowing the Word of God is the Word of God. Exactly. It is accurate. It is infallible. It is immutable. The word immutable means it does not change. Right. Malachi 3, 6, I'm the Lord, I change not. As I've tried to help people understand, God does not change. He just changed the covenant. Mm -hmm. That God is just as angry with sin as he was in the Old Testament. He's just that angry in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. It's just that the uh, covenant changed and the way of salvation is now paid for by the blood of Jesus and not by the blood of a turtle dove, a goat, a ram, or whatever the case might be. So that gives us certitude. I can believe God's word. That's it. I can trust God's word. I know that God's word is accurate. 
because a span of 1,500 years, the different men wrote different parts of the Bible. They are all synchronous. That's it's, it. It's, just, it's a great blessing. He don't want us to have any doubt. Amen. No doubt. And, and if you're doubting, uh, it's on your part. Yeah, absolutely. It's not on the validity and the authenticity God is of not God's the author word. of confusion. You got a I do email uh, a question. Well, a lady had emailed and wanted us to talk about spiritual warfare, uh, which I think is great timing. You know everything that we're going through, um, and to me, it kind of goes hand in hand with the armor of God. And so, I wanted to read over that chapter really quick here, uh, chapter six, verses fourteen through seventeen here. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Yeah, praying always with all prayer and supplication and the spirit being watchful to this and with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Um, so to me, he's given us everything that we need to fight these spiritual warfares. The warfare is going to intense, mm -hmm. intensify. Thus, it is demanded of every one of us to crank up our prayer lives yeah. and our spiritual walk mm -hmm. with God. Personally, I'm believing for some dynamic moves of God like we've never witnessed or seen before. And one of the great weaknesses, fragilities, that lies within the church, the body of Christ, when we get a victory, we cease, we quit, mm -hmm. we just roll over, or we go back to our old ways or our old paths. And that's how the enemy is able to creep back in and get another stronghold. Mm -hmm. um, I cannot emphasize the power of prayer. Yeah. If we would just spend more time in prayer, everyone loves to win. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I Especially mean, you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't like to lose. I'm not going to sit here and say I enjoy losing. Uh, it's hard for me to handle losing gracefully. Exactly. Uh, but the point is, if the church, the body of Christ, would stand up and fight fervently and with, with, with great courage, you know, Moses died Joshua was going to take up where Moses left off, and he had consternation and an element of fear. Mm -hmm. but, say, but God assured Joshua by saying, Joshua, as I was with Moses, so shall I also be with mm -hmm. thee. Be of good courage. In other words, be courageous. Exactly. But you've got to obey my words. You've got to keep my commandments. You, you've, you've got to honor my commandments in your personal life, if you do that, you shall have great success. Exactly. Great success. And it wasn't long after they had crossed the Jordan, they were having their battles, uh, and they got a, a, into a war with the Amalekites. And of course, Achan, you all know the story how Achan stole a wedge of gold, and he hid it under his tent. And so when Joshua went out to fight again, the Amalekites, he lost 36 soldiers. He comes back to God. He says, hey, what's the deal here? Yeah. We're not supposed to lose. We're supposed to succeed. You said you promised me great success. And God said, Joshua, there is sin in the camp. And so God predetermined. In this battle, he said, the booty, the spoils are mine. Mm -hmm. God doesn't need those temporal things right. in the earth, gold or whatever. But see, that was a challenge to people in their hearts mm -hmm. to make a choice. So when they ran over, ransacked the Amalekites, Achan decides, I'm going to take a piece of this gold and I'm going to hide it. 
So, of course, Joshua doesn't know that. No one knows it but God. So they go out to the battle the second time, and they lose 36 men. They come back to the camp. Joshua says to God, what's going on here? I'm supposed to have good success. Right. And when you lose 36 men, you lost a father, uh, a brother, Mm -hmm. an uncle, a nephew, whatever the case might be. So these other families were negatively affected by disobedience. And, of course, God says there's sin in the camp. I won't go into all the story, but Achan had hidden the wedge of gold under his tent. And when God lined, or Joshua lined them up, God pointed out to Joshua, this is the man with the sin. And so this is why we lose in spiritual warfare. Right. Sin. Mm -hmm. I've said it before. I'll say it again. I think I got this from E.W. E.M. Bounds. He's wrote many books on prayer. But he said, if a man keeps praying, he will quit sinning. If he quits praying, he will start sinning. Both of them cannot abide together. Right. You cannot be a lady, a woman of prayer, and still live in sin. Exactly. You've got to quit praying or you've got to quit the sin. Yeah. I cannot be a man of prayer and live in sin because my prayer life demands I live right. I can't keep coming to, before God and, and when I'm living a life of sin. So, and keep you know, repenting. You've know, you got to forgive me for this. Yeah. I, you know, that's not the kind of God that we serve. Right. We all miss the mark occasionally. But I don't live a life of sin. You don't live a life of sin. We still have the propensity oh, yeah. and the proclivity to sin. Mm-hmm. The tendency is there. It's there, yeah. But I don't live that way. And that's the difference. Uh, people live one way and they talk another way. Exactly. They say one thing and they live another way. So we are, we are in tremendous warfare concerning our nation. Yeah. And if we will continue to pray and pray fervently, and as Paul the Apostle said, praying in the Spirit, there are times we get down to pray, and sometimes it's just kind of like just words. Yeah. Uh, you're not nece- you don't necessarily feel an unction. Right. You don't feel an anointing, but you're walking by faith. You're being faithful, and you are still praying. And you may get to the middle of that prayer, and it really start coming to you, you know, in the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. You. But you'll never know until you start That's praying. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, there are times, I've, as soon as I've, my knees touch the floor, the Spirit of God would just brood over me and literally start praying in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Jude verse 20, beloved building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. He just took over. Uh, he, let me say something about the Holy Ghost. He always knows the mind of God. Oh, yeah. Because the Holy Spirit is God's spirit. Right. That's why he's called a Holy Spirit. He's not just a spirit. He's the Holy Spirit. He is the Spirit of God. And... Uh, Romans 8, 28, uh, Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit, Holy Spirit, also helpeth our infirmities or weaknesses. For when we know not what we ought to pray for as we should, the Spirit itself maketh intercession with mm. groanings which cannot be uttered. I don't have the words, but the Holy Ghost has the words. Yep. The reason he knows how to pray, he knows what's going on. Exactly. When I can't see... When you can't see, he always sees. Well, it's like we said earlier in a previous episode. Sometimes we get to talking about one thing and we kind of veer off to something else. And it's not that we intentionally do that. It's just the Holy Spirit may come and want to direct us in a different uh, way, you know. That's, that's the way the Holy Spirit operates. Yeah. Romans eight fourteen. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Mm-hmm. You know, I've started out. As, as, as in sermons going in yeah. the direction I thought, mm-hmm. but eight, nine, 10, 12 minutes into the sermon, I felt the switch go off and I had, I had got into the vein. That's where God wanted exactly. me. And my notes were then irrelevant. Yeah. They were totally insignificant. Why? Now I'm preaching with an unction. 
1 John 2, 20, you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. Now, that word unction means the smearing on of an anointing, mm-hmm. the anointing oil. Mm-hmm. Well, the anointing is the Holy Ghost. Exactly. I've had people ask me, what is the anointing? What is the anointing? The anointing is the, the Holy, Holy Ghost. Ghost. Acts 10.38, Peter said, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. I want you to notice what it says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost. Right. So the Holy Ghost is that anointing. The, the, the anointing is what helps me to preach, to teach, to help a singer exactly. sing, a musician to play. That's that, 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 that's the spirit of God. Yeah, you always hear, you know, that pastor has an anointing on his life or that singer has an anointing on her life. And that anointing is the Holy Ghost. Exactly. In Luke 4, his is the same initial first 12 verses there are the same as in Luke's gospel, I mean Matthew's gospel, chapter 4. Both are about him being in the wilderness. But in Luke's account, we go there to Luke 4, 18. He said, uh, 16, the spirit of the Lord is upon me mm-hmm. because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And regrettably, we have a lot of preachers who don't have an anointing. Exactly. And that anointing comes in its greatest and purest form as you dedicate and consecrate your life and your body mm-hmm. to the Lord. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've preached sometimes, I felt like, with no anointing. I've preached with a little bit of anointing. I've preached with a a modest anointing. And I've preached with a heavy anointing. Mm -hmm. I have prayed seemingly without any anointing Mm -hmm. and prayed with a little bit of anointing and prayed with a whole lot of anointing. And I knew the times I was praying with that heavy anointing, I was winning battles left and right. Exactly. I I was succeeding in the spirit now, yeah. you, you may not see it initially in the flesh, right? but you'll see the fruit afterwards. Exactly. Yeah. And I remember years ago uh, when I was pastoring in Charlotte, I got into a very heavy time of prayer one night and the Holy Ghost was praying. And I asked God to open my understanding. I said, what have I been praying for? He said, you've been praying for backsliders, people that have come to know me and have drifted and wafted away. And because if I pray in the spirit and I don't understand, then my understanding, Paul said, is unfruitful. Right. So I asked the Lord at times, I've been praying in the spirit. What have I been praying for? Help my understanding. Yeah. Luke 24, 45. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. The Holy Spirit can also open your understanding to understand the spiritual things right. of God. See, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 9. It is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Mm -hmm. So when one begins to pray in the Spirit, they're without a doubt going deeper. Exactly. And deeper and deeper. And of course, uh, tragically today, Pentecostalism Pentecostal denominations are now questioning the validity of the Holy Ghost. They're questioning, uh, is praying in the Spirit a reality? You know why they're questioning it? They probably haven't done it. They haven't done it. They're not experiencing it. And they're not living a life to be in that position or posture. You know, you you have to live a life that the Holy Ghost can interrupt your life and do whatever he wants to do. And once they experience it, they won't question it. Oh, Absolutely. You know, and, and so here we are, the lady asking about spiritual warfare. If there was ever a time that we need the anointing to pray, now. that anointing, again, is the Holy Ghost, and he just starts pulling down messes. He starts pulling down the powers, the principalities mm-hmm. of the air, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places, he begins to bring those down. Now, some of you watching will say, well, you know, sometimes I start to pray and it's just hard. Well, I'm going to tell you why it's hard. Your prayer 
is trying to get through the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. But if you keep praying, the Holy Ghost will burn a hole. He'll intercede, yeah. That's right. Through that power in the air and get you beyond that into the presence of God. Yeah. And, you know, Daniel fasted and prayed 21 days. And Gabriel says, Daniel, from the day you started praying, day one, your prayer was heard. But the prince of Persia, or the demon of Persia, withstood me, lo, 20 and one days. What does that tell you? As long as Daniel was praying, there was war in heaven. Exactly. And the war and the victory of that war was contingent upon Daniel's persistency. He didn't quit. For weeks now, for weeks now, I have, I've made it an effort to make sure I am praying every day, sometimes twice a day, three times a day, whatever the case might be. Why? I sense the need. God is trying to turn the course of this nation. Yeah. And I know, because I've read Daniel, I know if I keep being persistent, I'm going to get that breakthrough, exactly. just like Daniel mm -hmm. got it, but he would have gotten it the first day. But he said, the prince of Persia has withstood me. So he prays, Gabriel prays, for Michael to come fight the demon of Persia so Gabriel can give Daniel the answer. Gabriel is always known as a messenger angel. It was Gabriel who came to Mary right. and gave the message, you're going mm -hmm. to conceive and have a son. And that's why we look at angels, the, the two, the three. We know Lucifer's an archangel, Gabriel's an archangel, Michael's an archangel, and we look at their offices. Michael's always known for fighting and warring. Mm -hmm. Say, Revelation 12 and 7, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. Gabriel, it seems to be the one who messages. gives messengers. Now, he can fight. Mm -hmm. But his message fundamentally is to bring, or mess, his calling is to bring a message to whoever God needs him to get the message yeah. to. I find it amazing when Gabriel appears to Mary, she's not even troubled. She's not shaken. Yeah. She's not moved. It's like, and I believe she was in prayer. Yeah. Now that's my personal interpretation. I believe Mary was in prayer when the angel appeared. It didn't freak her out. Because she knew. She knew what was happening. Right. Yeah. Zachariah, the father of John, he's blown away when the angel shows up beside the altar. He's freaked out. Yeah. Well, it tells me he was like a lot of preachers. He was just doing his duty, his service, but he wasn't in prayer. Right. So it startled him. Mary, she wasn't startled. She wasn't freaked out. She just started talking to Gabriel. Yeah. And then she says, he says, you're going to have a baby Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. She said, "How can this thing be? I don't know a man." Exactly. And he said, "The Holy Ghost." See, explain to her, "The Holy Ghost is going to overshadow you. You're going to conceive in your womb, and that which you will conceive will be the Son of the Most High God. It'd be called a holy thing." Man, Zachariah is is bummed out. He's in such unbelief. God gives him a, a, a mute. He can't talk till John's born. Nine mm -hmm. months. He couldn't say a word. And then when he does get to say a word, his name's got to be John and not one of your other traditional names of your, yeah. of your uh, lintage. You, you're not going to be able to do that. This, who's called John? It was, a, it was a name God chose. Exactly. Say, yeah. was it the family just like me? Yeah. Your mama, Passing we, your we choose mm -hmm. to name you this, Wesley this, Linton this, Tarek this. That's our choice. God said, you don't like, you're not going to have a choice. Yeah. My point is prayer and continual prayer is what brings the victories. Yeah. Again, Gabriel said, for 20 and one days, or 21 days, I've had to fight the demon of Persia, so your prayer could be answered, and I get you the, the bring the answer to you. So you go to pray. Maybe you pray a day. You pray two days. You pray three days. You pray five days, and then you quit. The battle was lost. Because we ceased praying. Exactly. Got to keep pushing. Gate, uh, Daniel did not quit. He was a man of prayer. He was persistent. You know, people often wonder many times, especially in the ministry, 
you know, how I discern this or how I pick up on this or pick up on that. Persistent, mm-hmm. discipline. Yeah. Uh, nobody is making me pray like I'm praying it's right dedication. now. Dedication. Yeah. yeah. No, God didn't tell me you you need to spend an hour every day in prayer. God's never uh, uh, told me that except one time after that 40-day fast. I was so aggravated initially because I didn't get the answer I was looking for. And I remember I was in my office at the house praying. And, and I said, God, I'll go right back on another 40-day yeah. fast. I'd been off the fast, but maybe two months. Mm. And the Lord spoke to my heart and said, no, just pray. Three hours a day, like morning, noon, at night. And I began to pray for hours every day, walking wow. up and down the drive where the road out there on Upper Stanley. And I prayed, and I prayed. And I remember the day I walked in the house, the Holy Ghost said, you're ready. I'm going to download all this on you. I had to get to the right place. Exactly. Delay does not mean denial. Right. Delay is not no. No, it's that's just right. in his time. It's, you're not where you need to be. Right. You're, you're. I can't give this to you. I can't reveal this to you because you can't handle it right now. Jesus told the disciples in John 16, I've got many things to say unto you right now, but you're not able to bear them. Yeah. You know, people, people think, and that's the arrogancy in all of us, me included. We think, oh, I can have, just, just put Mm -hmm. it on me, Lord. Just, just, just go ahead. What he may put on you is so overwhelming, you're not able to handle it. Right. And the Bible says he won't put more on you than you can handle. So he's waiting till you can handle it. That's right. Yeah. You have to come to the place. Mm-hmm. Not, not, not Christ. He's already he's there. He's already there. He's, exactly. at the, he's at the place. Mm-hmm. The door. Why should God open a door for your ministry or whatever you're doing in life? Why should God open the door for you now when you're not even at the door or close exactly. to the door? Exactly, yeah. You know, people say, oh, God sent me the right help, mate. You're not praying about it. Right. You just want it to float into your life like a, 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 a feather falling down from a, a, an eagle. And that's how you just want it to be easy. Right. There's a cost to be paid, the costly ointment. In John chapter 12, when, when Judas said, that's $300, um, it's 300 pence, $300 worth of anointing oil, and you're going to waste it on putting this on Christ's feet? Well, we could have took that and bought food for the yeah. poor. And I did a message years ago, the costly anointing. It cost. Yeah. And see, most people aren't willing to pay the price to, to be touched with God's anointing. That's why they can't stand the onslaught when this warfare takes place. Yeah. Because they're not in the right place. Mm-hmm. God shouldn't open a door for me if I'm not there and ready exactly. to walk through it. Mm-hmm. Right now, I am praying for a pure, open door for this ministry. Yeah. You know, uh, the last several years, I've been around some people who, just to be candid, they don't. They just don't live right. They just don't live right, and I have come out. From among them. Right. Because I live right. Yeah. But I've seen the dishonesty. I've seen the lying. I've seen the drunkenness. I've seen the drinking. I've, I've seen these things. And I've just said, you know what? For what for that season, God opened that door. Yeah. But I have become a recluse in that sphere. And now I'm asking God for a pure door. Exactly. Where yeah. people are living right. Now they, they may be immature, they may be shallow. But I'm asking for a pure door yeah. because I want to be in a place where other people's hearts are desirous to be pure. Absolutely. You know, and regrettably, just because you can get a listening audience and a viewing audience and you got a mic and a camera, that don't mean squat to God. Mm-mm, no, he See, sees the heart. That's right. And, and, and so God is, is not only moving. There were some dynamic and great moves that are about to take place. But here's the key. The devil's not going to give that ground to you freely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're going to pay a price. Yeah. You're going to pay a price. I I, I said uh, in 2016, October of 2016, before Trump was elected, I said, y'all need to get ready for warfare because the liberals are not going to uh, let you overturn Roe v. Wade. Same-sex yeah. marriage. They're not going to give up this ground. There's going to be a battle for this ground. Yeah, they're fighting. But Second Chronicles 2017 says, you shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, 
stand ye still mm -hmm. and see the salvation or the deliverance of God with you. Listen, if we pay the price, God's going to fight the battle. Yeah. I, 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 Jordan and I were in the parking lot the other day talking. This is a little bit gross. Oh, Lord. A little bit <laughs> off the wall. But after David defeated Goliath, yeah. Saul was jealous. So you know how Saul tried to get David killed? He said, David, I don't want a, a dowry or a price for my daughter. But I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you my daughter if you'll bring me 100 foreskins of Philistines. Well, don't mess with God's man. Yeah. David goes out and he brings back 200 foreskins of, man, of those Philistines' foreskin. Wow. In a bag. Yeah. What Saul was trying to do was get David killed. Yeah. Because he had to, he had, the, he, you know, where Saul said, go go kill a hundred Philistines. Exactly. That's essentially what, yeah. And bring them back. Not only did he do a hundred, he did two hundred. The man of God says, oh, wait a minute. I'll do better. Wow. So he had to slew, slay 200 men to get 200 foreskins, and he brings them back in a bag and says, here you here go, you Saul. Go. Well, the Bible says Saul realized God was exactly. with him. Exactly. Absolutely. Then the fear came on Saul. Don't mess oh, with this man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so David, no doubt when he's that little shepherd boy, Tending to his father, Jesse's sheep, he's a man of prayer. Yeah. And just like the 23rd Psalm, what a beautiful psalm from a true shepherd, David. And he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I yes, shall not want. We want to thank you for tuning in today as we discuss current events from a biblical perspective. Please feel free to send us your questions. Who knows, your question may be the one they discuss on the next edition of talking it out please send your emails to talking it out at the voice of evangelism.com again talking it out at the voice of evangelism.com or write us at talking it out p.o box 502 kaiser north carolina 28020 again that's p.o box 502 kaiser north carolina 28020 